welcome to another session of the Public Intellectual Lecture Series of Far Eastern University. I am Leo from the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies, and today's topic is Human Security from the National and International Perspective. The speakers for today's sessions are Dr. Ramel Banlawi, Chairman of the Board of the Philippine Institute for Peace, and, for Peace Violence, and Terrorism Research, and Professor Herman Kraft of the Department of Political Science of the University of the Philippines. Herman, Romel, thank you very much for accommodating us for today. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So perhaps we can begin with something very basic. Um, what exactly is human security? So perhaps we can have a working definition of human security from the national and international or global perspective. And perhaps you, um, both of you can expound on why this is important both on the micro and macro level of Filipino society. Perhaps we can start with you, sure. uh, Herman. Well, um, human security came up as a concept actually uh, uh, that the 1994 UN um, Human Development Report came up with. It was a time when there were a lot of, um, uh, shall we say, uh, internal issues that were actually taking place. Uh, around that time, you're talking about the massacres in Rwanda, the uh, massacres in Srebrenica, for instance, in, uh, in what was going on in uh, Yugoslavia. Um, and, and so the main question there was if we continue looking at things, uh, if we continue looking at security from a national security perspective, meaning to say that the object of security continues to be the state, you know, then the question be what happens when you're talking about the state being the one that's responsible for creating insecurity for its people? Um, and, and so the, um, the, the UN Development Report actually came up with the concept of human security, where it talks about the idea that security should be seen in terms of freedom from fear and freedom from want. Okay? Um, in fact, I think a third concept was brought in later on about the freedom of future generations to, to enjoy the kind of quality of life that we are enjoying right now. Um, but the point here is that it goes beyond the idea of security as being simply about uh, physical security. Right, the survival of the human being. For you're also talking about quality of life here, because um, I think what what the uh, 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 how human security was operationalized in that document, it included I think seven concepts, and that included things like economic security, aside from physical security, environmental security. So all of these things were actually being brought in, which now comes to a to an interesting point because um, it raises questions about. Uh, what kinds of capacities then uh, do governments have to have in order to be able to address the question of human security? In other words, before, if you talked about national security, it was primarily military political, right? So the focus of security was on the capacity of uh, institutions like the military or the police. Now you're talking about things like, for instance, the capacity of the entire government to actually provide the kind of quality of life that would make people feel secure in the kinds of uh, everyday conditions that they have to actually deal with. Uh, so in, in, that, in that context, that's where the norm, the international norm actually came. Um, the interesting thing about the Philippines is that um, since the uh, Aquino administration, the Philippine government has been coming out with a national security policy. Uh, and uh, to a large extent, the basic concepts that you actually have there approximates. It's not exactly the same, but it approximates the international definition of what human security is supposed to be all about, right? So in that sense, it redounds to the security of the human person as opposed to the idea of the security of the state uh, per se, right? Thank you. Um, anything to add? Uh, yeah, uh, th that's right. Uh, human security is a product of a debate challenging the traditional concept of security, which is state-centric. Uh, during the Cold War, when you talk about security, it is defined as national security, meaning the security of the state against external threat emanating from other states. But after the end of the Cold War, the referent of security uh, now focuses on the security of the people. It becomes uh, people-centric or human-centric security. So when you talk about threats to people's security or human security, what are these threats? So threats are not only emanating from other states or external threats, but happening within the states. And what are these? Poverty. So when you talk about poverty, you talk about food security or economic security. Then you talk about destruction of the environment. So we have environmental security, but at the same time, uh, the breaking down of political institutions. So you talk about political security and in the third world, 
many threats are in fact happening inside and even the state was a threat to human security so for of the political regime so human security talks about the security of human being even against their own government oppressive government so that's the nature of political security but uh, as a result of that security becomes comprehensive and human security reflects the comprehensive scope of security right now so the main difference is that we have the traditional security which is state-centric and the non-traditional security, uh, which is human-centric, and this non-traditional security defines the overall concept of human security. And what are these non-traditional security issues? Then you talk about threats from poverty, environment, transnational organized crime, terrorism, e even from your own government, even from the police, can be viewed as a threat to your own security. So human security embraces a people-oriented, human-centered concept of security as against traditional security, which is military-oriented and state-focused. Thank you very much, uh, for both of you. For because this is a very interesting uh, perspective. Because right now, what we're saying is human security is not about the preservation of the state, but increasing the quality of life of the people of a particular community or nation. If I'm not mistaken. So, given that. Um, perhaps you can provide um, as a brief overview of human of the conditions of human security in the country. Again, from perhaps the no, uh, from the national and international perspective, and perhaps present some issues which you think are challenging or affecting our appreciation of human security in the country as citizens, as well as our quality of life. Now, perhaps you can start this time with. Well, when you talk about human security threats to the Filipinos, of course, the number one will be the issue of their, their economic status, poverty. So we're raising issues of food security and economic security. So if you want to address human security concerns, then our uh, benchmark for that is the human security index. Are we fulfilling the needs of our own people? based on human security index. And what are these? Ability to have uh, uh, decent livelihood, decent shelter, decent education, and even enough food on their plate. Okay, So those are things that we, uh, we measure. And if you have all these things, then you have some, some sort of securities if you have these things. But if you're lacking of these things, if you lack these things, then you feel insecure. So that's the, that's the measure. And the, the common measure now is the human security, uh, the human development index. And now we are adopting what we call the human security uh, index. So it's being measured with a comprehensive uh, um, issues that will address what we call the needs of the human being, human security needs. So good air, good environment, uh, good food, good shelter, good education those things uh, that uh, fulfill the needs of human beings. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, the emphasis, of course, on the human person, right? Human communities. But at the same time, that does not absolve the state of its responsibilities uh, because you're still talking about the idea of who's going to be responsible for providing all of this, right? So if you talk about economic security, for instance, which actually includes the idea of um, uh, of what, what Romel was actually talking about in terms of addressing poverty. That's not something that individuals can do on their own. So which means the state's still actually involved in that particular uh, context. You talk about political security, that includes things like human rights, for instance. Um, in, in which case, uh, it becomes important to actually talk about state capacity, right? Uh, not as the object of security, per se, but the state's capacity to actually provide uh, the, the uh, human person with what would be considered the, um, uh, the capacities to be able to deal with uh, everyday conditions, right? Um, and, and so in that sense, one important aspect of human security, it might be implicit, it's not an explicit thing, but it really talks about or it implies the importance of state capacity to be able to provide all of these things, right? To be able to respond to the needs of the people uh, in whichever capacity you're actually looking at this. So um, it involves capacity at local, you know, regional, national levels. You know? um, and then, of course, uh, to a certain extent, it also talks about being part of an international community and being able to actually address uh, international norms that we, 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 we adhere to, for instance. 
Thank you. Which leads me to my next question because you're uh, actually you're emphasizing economics, yes. poverty, and how it influ or how it has a tremendous impact on the quality of life of ordinary Filipinos. But as we can see, um, even if there are the there seems to be a worsening condition. Poverty seems to be worsening on a yearly basis, um, despite high economic growth as reflected in government data. It seems that people um, seem to not be enjoying you know, the fruits of the economic growth. Now that is, a, I think, a discussion we can discuss on a different uh, mm -hmm. topic or a different day. You know? But I was thinking, since most of the issues of hum human security, in uh, most of the issues of human security involve poverty, how does poverty impact, for example, very important, very critical issues um, faced by ordinary Filipinos, like the drug war, for example. No? Um, you have the drug war uh, wherein most of the alleged victims or most of the casualties no, are coming from impoverished communities. No? And then, how does that contribute to you? Is there, you mentioned something about capacity. No? How does the government programs, or how do government programs address the economic conditions of those who are casualties or who are, who's being targeted by the drug war? And in terms of capacity, is it working? No. Perhaps uh, Herman can start. Well, if you think about it, um, the, question, the responsibility, as far as economic issues are actually concerned, um, we talk of our society as fundamentally adhering to a neoliberal economic uh, agenda. So the idea of opening up our markets, um, uh, inviting uh, uh, foreign investments, no? I mean, of course, the consequences this might have in terms of uh, the capability of uh, local Filipino capitalists to, com to, to, to compete with, um, uh, with foreign capital that's coming in. Um, and of course, this brings in questions of, well, how do this uh, affect the everyday lives of people, which basically means you're talking about quality of jobs that are actually available. Um, and I think this is where the issue actually comes up. In, in other words, if you're talking about uh, state capacity, you're not just talking about the capacity of the state to provide, you know, to provide uh, uh, jobs, for instance, right? That's, that's not what we're actually talking about. But you're talking about the capacity of the state to actually provide the environment within which um, Filipinos will actually be able to uh, engage in everyday economic uh, uh, activities. Like, for instance, um, one of the things that's, that's uh, interesting about, about um, uh, the Philippine economy is the extent to which it's been kept afloat by the remittances of Filipino uh, overseas workers, for instance. Now, the question is, why are they going overseas, right? Um, and this is where the idea of uh, whether or not there are jobs that can actually uh, uh, provide them with the kind of um, quality of life, kind of uh, uh, lifestyles that they feel uh, they, 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 they aspire to. Um, and so in, in that context, uh, it becomes a question of what is it that the state should actually be providing? Good education, for instance, right? For them to be able to compete, to be, to be able to actually uh, have a, a, the capacity to contribute to uh, a growing economy. Uh, um, and 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 an not, not just an industrializing economy, you know, but, but an economy that, that, that's going beyond what we talk about as, uh, uh, as an industri uh, industrializing one, right? We talk about uh, the idea of a service economy. Um, and, and so it brings up questions of what is it that the government should actually be focusing on if we're talking about um, empowering our people, right? So you can talk about education, you can talk about jobs, for instance, you can talk about things about, uh, like, like the environment, right? Providing people with a kind of, uh, uh, as Romel mentioned, clean air, for instance, right? Because that goes back to health security, for instance, right? So all of these things are actually interconnected, so to speak, right? Uh, and, and a significant part of that goes back to the capacity of the state to provide the foundations within which people are going to be able to live uh, uh, the kind of quality of life that they aspire to. Definitely. So, it's obvious that the direction um, that human security should go towards is providing social services which are sustainable and can be enjoyed no, by ma the majority in order to, so that poverty will not emerge or we can address poverty. But obviously, um, 
if there's anything we can see in terms of even historical conditions of the Philippines, the lack of access to government, to social services, you know, the, the lack of access to opportunity, it inevitably leads to conflict. Of course, we're in an urban area. You know, we don't necessarily see it. Of course, in terms of poverty, we see from the urban poor, and in fact, even from the drug war. But in terms of especially the regions, the underdeveloped areas, where conflict, where conflict ensues, no? and you know, the struggle involves not just participation or social participation in rallies or even in governance but actual armed conflict no um, what is the government try um, what are government policies that try to address conflict in these areas especially peace is now becoming a very critical issue for development it's as if we're now seeing development social services especially in underrepresented highly impoverished areas they will not occur without peace no? Romel, perhaps you can give us an idea right? yeah first uh if you talk about poverty, you can link that with a lot of many issues, uh, drugs, terrorism, rebellion. So, uh, but poverty is not the only driver of many of these problems. But poverty makes people prey to this kind of problem. And that is why our Philippine government has adopted a medium-term development plan that addresses the various aspects of our national problem including security problem. So when it comes to some uh, to security problems, like for example, Muslim rebellion and communist insurgency, uh, we have uh, uh, approaches to, to deal with that. So when it comes to the Muslim rebellion, we, uh, we pursued peace talks with uh, Muslim rebels. So we had a peace talks with the Moro National Liberation Front that was signed in 1996. Then we had this uh, uh, peace, uh, peace agreement with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front signed in 2014 until we uh, have this Bangsamoro Organic Law that uh, was signed into law last year and now being implemented with, uh, with the plebiscite last January. Now we have the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao replacing the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao. So that's it. But at the same time, we still have problem in Mindanao. We are still facing uh, what I call two sources of armed conflicts in Mindanao. There's still continuing armed rebellion from the Muslim front emanating from pro-ISIS groups uh, like the Bangsamoro Islamic Freedom Fighter, we have the Abu Sayyaf group, we have the Ansar Khalifa Philippines, and other lawless elements of the Moro uh, Islamic Liberation Front, and even rogue factions of the Moro National Liberation Front. So we have that, but at the same time, we also have this problem with communist insurgency. The epicenter of communist insurgency right now is in Mindanao, particularly uh, in regions 11 and 12, in Agusan uh, provinces, Dabao provinces, Surigao Province, yes, Compostela Valley. So we have this problem now. Uh, right now, the approach of the Philippine government is to open to the possibility of peace talks with the uh, uh, communist uh, movement, but at the same time, they have this uh, re uh, prerequisites for the resumption of peace talks. But mean meanwhile, while that is not happening, the Philippine government is now implementing what the armed forces of the Philippines would call focus military operations. So that's what the Philippine government is doing now. But at the same time, while doing a military approach, the Philippine government is also implementing non-military uh, approach. Like for example, political solution to the armed conflict in Mindanao, we have the Bangsamoro Organic Law. But at the same time, they are implementing uh, economic measures to improve that. So we have the Mindanao Development Authority to take care uh, uh, of that uh, issue. So uh, officially, the Philippine government is implementing comprehensive approach. But we still need to see whether the outcome of the approach will really yield fruitful, uh, fruitful benefits to the people in need. So that's the problem. We're only talking about Mindanao, but we also have problem in Luzon and in Visayas. We all communist army agencies all over the Philippines, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. And even the threat of terrorism is also Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao now. Yeah. Perhaps Herman, you can add to that. I was just wondering, why is peace so important? No, because you mentioned no development. There can, no, there can be no development unless there is peace. No? But we're talking about impoverished areas outside of Manila. Yeah. So why should the Manila, the urbanite, no, the care about what is happening in Mindanao, especially, and I'm going to ask later no, about Marawi because yeah. you were talking about 
military and peaceful uh, non-military solutions. But if we're going to use Marawi as a case study, no, there seems to be something like that. But anyway, let's start with um, why is peace so important even to the person living in a privileged position in, urban er in an urban area? Well, the literature tells us uh, that development and security are practically uh, two phases of the same coin, so to speak, right? That um, in order for us to actually have security, you know, there must be a sense that our lives are actually becoming better, both at the societal level as well as at the individual level. So that means the expectations of people about their, ordin their, their, their everyday uh, uh, conditions um, is connected to security in the sense of how they feel about themselves, right? So which means that um, uh, the, I guess you could, you, you could actually say that the, the motherhood statement there is that development and security are actually interconnected, right? Um, but if you want to go down to brass tacks, for instance, so you mentioned the privileged position of Manileños, right? Uh, why should we care about what's going on in the provinces? Well, let's put it this way. Um, many times, food scarcity brings up the the, the prices of food, for instance. Where is that coming from? That's, that's actually coming from supplies coming from outside of Metro Manila, right? So in, uh, if you're talking about vegetables, for instance, coming from the Cordilleras, right? Um, when things like uh, typhoons come in and then they get cut off, right? So which means that you're not going to get vegetables actually going to Pangasinan that can be transported to Metro Manila. That means the price of food actually goes up. Right? So it affects us in a very, very direct way if you're thinking of those kinds of things. Um, now, if you think about conflict, right? Um, Mindanao is one of our biggest bread baskets if you're actually talking about the production of food, for instance. Um, the main problem of Mindanao is that it's always seen as, as, as being besieged by uh, conflict, right? Um, there might be uh, governments that might be interested in investing there know in order to actually help economic development there but they're always stunted by the fact that well we don't we, we're not sure about what what the security situation is you know um, uh, tourists from other countries are always prevented from coming going to Mindanao why well because of the conflict that's going on there right uh, they always get these kinds of uh, uh, these kinds of uh, uh, advisories from their respective em embassies right so in other words if you want if you want uh, conditions, economic conditions to actually improve in these areas outside of Metro Manila, the issue of uh, peace and security becomes an important uh, uh, factor. And that, you know, to, us, to, to, to a large extent, is eventually going to, uh, to redound to the conditions that we have in Metro Manila. Right? So it's important for Manilenos to, or people in Metro Manila, to care about what's going on outside. Right? Uh, it's not just finding it difficult to go to go to the beautiful beaches of, of, of Bongao in uh, in Tawi Tawi, for instance, right? So it's those kinds of things that we need to actually uh, uh, understand that that our security, you know, is connected to the security of other people, you know, outside of Metro Manila. That's a very good point. So basically, the connection, the the position there is we have to care because we are related or we are yeah. connected to them, no? which brings me back, Ramel, to this to Marawi, no, because. <coughs> Um, you mentioned mi uh, something about military solutions to addressing armed conflict, especially in um, conflict areas like Mindanao. Um, now, Marawi, for, um, for a lot of people, is a very popular issue you know, because, of course, the, the fears of martial law. So we can see the military solution to what is happening in Marawi. But there are, it's also the other side of the coin, which is reconstruction. No? Because after the, the various military operations in Marawi, the, we we can see no there is the armed the the armed solution of the state no but what about reconstruction what about the lives of the people in Marawi because last time I heard I think the the government position was it will leave the reconstruction of Marawi to public to private enterprises and what do you think about that and how does that relate to addressing conflict in Marawi and later on to the greater area of Mindanao. Well, if you really want to uh, improve the situation in Marawi, you really have to rebuild Marawi. But unfortunately, there are some issues regarding how to start the building. Like for example, the concept of normalization. Uh, they, uh, the, the people affected by the Marawi siege, they want the resumption of their normal life. 
unfortunately, the Philippine government and the people affected by the siege, they have different concept of normalization. For the affected families, particularly in the main battle area now called the most affected areas, their concept of their normalization is to be able to go back to their original place and rebuild their home. But the Philippine government has a different concept of a normalization. It's a new normal, meaning they want to rebuild a new Marawi that is not the same with the old Marawi. A new Marawi will rise up. So now we have that kind of problem. Now the Philippine government presented a, uh, a model of a new Marawi, like uh, several stories of building where you can put all these residents there. No, we want to come back to our original house and then rebuild it even without the help of the government, even the private sector, they will rebuild their, yes, they want to go back, but this is now the problem. Most of them cannot go back. They don't have land titles to their area. They're informal settlers from the perspective of the state. And now, th that is fueling frustration now. So they are telling them, you can go back, but not the old way. There will be a new normal in Marawi. And now that's now the, the, the debate. Now the excuse of the Philippine government now on why there is a delay in the building and reconstruction activities is that there's still a lot of unexploded uh, ordinance and bombs in the area. They're still clearing it, okay? And they are now in the final phase of the clearing. Uh, once that is clear, then they can start the, the what they call the vertical and horizontal uh, 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 infrastructure development. But the problem is that uh, the people is resisting the, the model being presented by the <coughs> Philippine government because they insist to go back to their original homes and even without the help of the government, they will rebuild their homes. Samia, we don't need, we don't need government help, just allow us to, to go back there and we will rebuild our houses. But, you know, there's a technicalities technicalities about where's your land title, technicalities about how can you rebuild your home, and then technicalities about it's still not safe to rebuild your home. So the delay in the normalization phase is causing a lot of frustrations now. And this frustration is in fact being taken advantage by threat groups to recruit armed rebels in the area. Now, I went there during the first year of Marawi and the second year of Marawi liberation. And during the first year of Marawi liberation and the second year, I see deterioration of the situation. And I see different three refugee camps there. And the tent city, <coughs> then we have uh, a middle city uh, uh, made of, uh, of Nipahat and uh, cemented refugee camps um, made of good uh, houses but small but with the, all the amenities like like the wi-fi and even uh, 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 tv signals and electricity but i think the most problematic area there is the tent city where there's no electricity no water no supplies and i think that's a field to ground for recruitment and this is the place where you can see the highest level of frustrations highest labor of prostrations. Now, when President Duterte said that I will encourage the private sector to rebuild Marawi, it's fueling prostration among those who not, not have uh, capacity to access the private sector. So what will happen to the, the ordinary people? And now, uh, armed groups are taking advantage of that situation to, re to recruit from their ranks to continue the rebellion. And they're offering uh, monetary uh, reward for those who will join them in the rebellion in the name of another ideology propagated by the Islamic State. So that's now the situation in Marawi. So the Philippine government right now is saying that in order to prevent this thing to happen, then we have to implement martial law. Uh -huh. And when it comes to martial law, it's a debate you know, in the area, but um, the, those benefiting from martial law implementation, they like martial law, but those being affected by the, by the military operations, uh, they, don't, they, they dislike martial law. But this is what I observe about the effect of martial law. The implementation of martial law in Mindanao tames the behavior of local politicians and warlords. 
now local politicians uh, are exercising restraint in terms of using violence in the area because the military will say if you don't behave we will take over remember this is martial law we will take over uh, the local government so those local uh, politicians involved in rido right now or mean, meaning clan war no longer doing the rido by by armed violence rido is now in the social media you know they're quarreling over social media right now but the use of violence is being tamed by martial law but we martial law cannot stay there forever so that's the effect because um uh if you want a normal situation in Mindanao, then eventually the civilians should take over the governance uh, area there. So uh, now, there is now contemplation on whether to extend an martial law again because the situation in the area is still difficult. There's still a threat from, from uh, pro-ISIS elements there. There's still continuing entry of foreign terrorist fighters. Uh, the Bank Samoa Islamic Freedom Fighter is now what we call the new MILF. Mm. They're continuing the armed struggle there. Uh, and the Bank Samoa Islamic Freedom Fighter, particularly the one being led by uh, Commander Toraipe, is now systematically recruiting affected families by the Marawi siege. So that's it. And another uh, area to be, to, to be, uh, to be uh, watched is the performance of the Bangsamoro government. Right now, there is an MILF-led transition government. They have three years to prepare everything in order to set up a new political system that will really cater to the aspiration of the Bangsamoro people. If they don't deliver in three years, that will fuel another frustration. So that's, that's the challenge now of the, of, the, uh, of the Bangsamoro government right now. If they fail to deliver, by 2022, then the local politicians and the local warlords can hijack the agenda of the Bangsamoro government by 2022 because there will be another election in 2022. So who will constitute the Bangsamoro government? If the old faces will uh, form the Bangsamoro government, then we will face more of the same scenario in Mindanao. <coughs> but if the Bangsamoro government will deliver and can make a difference between now and 2022, I think that can spell the difference. But still, the, the situation is very, very uh, fluid. So right now, I consider the main, ch main challenge on the hand of the Bangsamoro government, they need to deliver. Mm. Because if they fail to deliver, armed rebellion will not stop in India. Question, because you mentioned about, you talked about the disconnect between governance and ordinary people. And this has their human, their level of human insecurity, in fact, made them vulnerable to armed groups. Isn't that sort of like a vicious cycle we're in? Due to the disconnect, you have people being enticed to join or having the motivation to join these, uh, to join armed resistance, which later on would justify the continued existence and implementation of martial law in various areas of Mindanao. That's the dilemma of the state Liyue, eh? because the government acts very slow and the armed groups, they act very fast. So by the time you find a solution, to a <laughs> the government finds a solution to a certain problem, the nature of threat has already evolved because they act twice as fast than the government. Like for example, you want to rebuild Malawi. The government is slow by nature of the bureaucracy and the political process and all the technicalities. But at the same time, armed groups, they recruit very fast. They recruit very fast. And now, two years have passed. And within that two years, well, the most affected area is still there. No, no, no upward and uh, no vertical and horizontal infrastructures. But in two years, we, we already have, you know, cadre of another <laughs> local fighters that the government needs to face. Thank you, Rama. So I was just, I just like lead. I would like to lead to that next discussion because martial law during when um, when president duterte attempted or pushed forward the idea of martial law for not just for marawi but i think for for most the areas in the mindanao, now, no? mindanao it was met with resistance no from various sectors various groups but eventually it was passed by congress it was approved by congress with an overwhelming majority from both um the house and the senate and then it's also virtually unheard of 
for martial law in our history, no, with the exception of uh, the time of president, for martial law to be extended again with an overwhelming majority from both houses of Congress. No? I would just like to get your ideas about this, Herman. No? Because it seems, no, if Marawi is a mic if we can use Marawi as a microcosm, no, the disconnect between government and people, it seems to be not just on a local level like Marawi or a an island level like Mindanao, but even from a national level where you have on one hand people's aspirations and then democratic institutions doing something else or implementing a different or implementing projects or policies of a different direction. Yeah. This is where the question of um, institutionalized governance actually comes in, right? Uh, the assumption is that um, uh, it doesn't matter which party is in power. Not that there are really mm. political parties here, but 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 it doesn't matter who, uh, uh, which party is in power, who is the president, no, and which administration is actually uh, uh, in control of government. Um, that there's still a continuity as far as policies uh, uh, are actually concerned, right? Um, there are a number of issues here. Uh, number one is that, and this is connected to the idea of martial law. Why, why are we turning to martial law, for instance? Why is it something that, uh, that the Duterte administration sees the, uh, uh, as the way out of the kind of problems that we actually have now? Um, it's, it's a shortcut, right? It's somehow a recognition or at least uh, um, uh, a sense on the part of the administration that going with normal politics mm -hmm. is not going to actually address the kinds of issues that we actually have, right? Especially if you're talking about time bound mm -hmm. no, uh, or time um, urgent uh, uh, kinds of issues. If you talk about the Marawi uh, rehab, for instance, you know, um, as people continue to be prevented from continuing with their normal lives, no, then the level of frustration and uh, uh, the, the, the expectations that they actually have you know, keep on growing up. So the, the question there is, can normal politics deliver on mm. this, right? And, and I think the, the sense of the administration is that no, right? And, and we can see this in, in, in terms of other issues, right? When we talk about the idea of uh, traffic mm. uh, in Metro Manila, mm. for instance, right? Um, it's a big issue. Why? Because some, some estimates made by the uh, uh, Asian Development Bank several years back no, have actually said that um, our economic losses because of everyday traffic are enormous, for instance, right? Um, and what is it that Pres President Duterte is actually saying? That you have to give me emergency powers in order for me to be able to deal with the issue of, if you don't give me emergency powers, then I'm sorry, then that's, that's not something that we can actually uh, uh, deal with. So in other words, the, the, the sense is a, a, um, uh, a, a diminution, if you will, mm. of trust in local political processes, mm. right? Uh, the, the, the sense is that we have to actually do shortcuts. We have to do emergency um, uh, or to institute emergency mechanisms in order to be able to uh, uh, address all of these issues. Now, we can't operate that way, right? In other words, um, this is where the issue of government capacity, of state capacity actually comes in. We can't keep on saying that, well, in order to address, in other words, we can't keep on um, dealing with everyday crisis, uh, everyday problems, no, as crisis, yeah. right? In other words, short oh, oh, no. diba? Y yun yung, that's, that's basically what's, what's going on right now, um, that we're treating what ought to be normal political processes or normal political issues you know, as crisis situations which requi require you know, um, uh, 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 urgent, uh, uh, an, a certain urgency you know, um, and therefore a demand on our part to actually move from normal politics to something else. Mm. Um, and I think we have to get out of that uh, mm. uh, mindset, right? Um, although admittedly, uh, we've dug the hole mm. you know, over mm. all of these decades of I won't, I won't say that um, I, I won't say that it's it's been uh, uh, um, misgovernance, if you will, right? But but it's just that so many things that are really basic, you no, know, and, and that has to do with government capacities to do, you know, agencies being able to do what they're supposed to do, right? Um, have been set aside, you no, know, and the, the the tendency is to actually act on these things, you no, know, uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, emergency uh, uh, conditions, no? treating them as crisis, for instance, no? and, and trying to. Um, 
the the idea of uh, of the increase in our inflation rate, for instance, no, um, just uh, uh, towards the end of uh, 2018, for instance, um, the question there is what needs to be done, and of course there were a lot of issues that were actually being being brought in, um, but it's not normal politics that was actually being uh, uh, advanced there, right? We need to actually bring in things like tarification, like, you know, and this has to be urgently mm -hmm. addressed, right? Which raises questions of why, why is it that every time we deal with these kinds of problems, it's always a crisis, of, right? Which uh, requires we, centralization we, of power. Exactly, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, so we, uh, to a large extent, this is something that we need to actually uh, 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 address to a, uh, to a large extent, right? The, the, the over-reliance uh, on, 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 on governments, more particularly the over-reliance in areas where you have uh, crisis conditions like uh, Mindanao, for instance, the over-reliance on the military being, able to, uh, being at the forefront of what is essentially governance, right? So, in other words, what we need to do is strengthen government capacities to do normal government activities, no, and address normal uh, and to undertake those activities in order to address normal uh, uh, issues, no, so that we don't get to a point where it's always going to be a crisis that we need to actually address. That's an in interesting point, Ram, because I was thinking you mentioned something about crisis, urgency, and yet not every issue is a crisis. No? It requires, rather than an immediate action, it requires government to work or function properly. Mm -hmm. But what I was thinking was, for people of a certain position or certain privileges, they can wait. No? But I was thinking, because that might be the root no, of the popularity. You know, because even with all these issues, you know, the popularity rate of the, of the government in, in particular you know, seems to be still very high. But what I was thinking was, the most people, especially those in impoverished areas or those who are not in privileged positions, they're in the hole that you were mentioning. They're at the bottom of the hole. And they feel that government and actual uh, proper government function will not lead to immediate relief. So that's why they feel President Duterte, or there is a need for authoritarian rule, centralization of power. No? For them, what do you think would be the trade-offs for such a scenario? Wherein, to, for example, Marawi, mm -hmm. due to um, the influence on Congress, he can ease, and now especially in the recent elections, no, where now a supermajority is or uh, is in the, the supermajority in the legislative is actually now connected to or engaging. There's a very close connection between the administration, and then you have the judiciary now being. I think how many appointees? I think uh, does the president Duterte have for this particular batch of uh, justices? I remember, but uh, but yeah, I think it will it will comply. Yeah. It will comprise a significant yeah. majority, you know. And then of course you have issues. Or allegations no, that the that the executive is interfering no, with the judiciary yeah. because they feel the judiciary is a bar is a barrier to necessary emergency actions. Mm -hmm. What would be the trade-off in the event that centralization of power or authoritarian rule does happen? Sigar, so, let's start with you, Ramel. Well, what we have right now is a populist government with a very limited time to deliver his campaign promises. So the government now resorts to a lot of shortcuts mm. in order to continue the popularity. So that's now the situation that we have. So my sense is that this government is more interested on short-term gain without looking into the long-term consequences. Anyway, he will only stay until 2022. So that's Assuming why, he yeah. stays until 2022. Yeah. So that's his mind frame to, 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 to remain popular and use this popularity to, to justify what he's currently doing. So that's now the, the style of the, the government right now. And if you will look at his tendency, his tendency is really very illiberal, not, not the illiberal meaning uh, using the trappings That's of democracy. That's a very interesting term. Not non-liberal, but illiberal. illiberal yeah. He's an illiberal uh, leader using the trappings of democracy to justify his uh, leadership, but at the same time undermining the same democracy through his 
authoritarian uh, approach. Uh, anyway, this is a uh, this this is the style of the the Duterte government. But the good thing, we still have the democratic institutions, and we can still use these democratic into institutions to check the current government and account for the abuse uh, in power. But at the same time, uh, Duterte is uh, taking advantage of his popularity to lure other government officials to rally behind him. So now he has the support of the judiciary, the Congress, the, the local governments. Now, that encourages him more to do a lot of extra yeah. rem, extra judicial <laughs> measures to address many problems that we face as a nation uh, that's that's why he always makes us an issue a crisis in order to justify his uh, action so in fact my term for that is that he wants to securitize everything mm -hmm. to justify security measure uh, he's securitizing everything, eh? even the problem of traffic is uh, securitized. So in, in traffic, of MMDA, a former military, the LG now there is a pending uh, pending bill in Congress about uh, law for homeland security, yeah. in order to empower the the local government on security security matters then we now have the the amendment of the human security act of 2007 mm -hmm. which will become the new anti-terrorism law by 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 this year now we have the rotc uh bill ROTC, yeah. now there's now a bill in congress on the uh, national defense act a new national defense act so a lot of uh, measures that this government uh, wants to have in order to justify more power of the state more power of the state so uh, that's now the the, the situation and the, the police is happy the military is happy because it's empowering them empowering them but the good thing is that we still have the 1987 constitution mm -hmm. now Which they want to change the 1987 yeah, yeah. constitution in order to adopt a new political system that is will be federal in form but i don't think uh, that will prosper by 2022 but what the philippine government is doing now is by these issues now Duterte now have in enough room for political maneuver with all these uh, people behind him and the result of the election this year is like a zeal of approval of what it's doing so and now the people seems to to like it the popularity is still high but the middle class like us the intellectual uh, like us find it very problematic <laughs> thank you but anything to add uh, herman um yes I, I i agree with what romel is actually saying and 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 to a large extent one of the things that needs to be uh, uh take into consideration here um are is that that balance between uh short term uh, uh problem solving and the long-term consequences that it, this might have you know for things like Institutions, for instance, right, um, and and I, and I think this is part of the the uh, uh, shall we say um, uh, the attempts on our part to really reflect on, you know, what is it that we're actually uh, uh, facing right now, uh, because the question here is, um, are we in agreement with the idea that um, uh, a president with authoritarian <coughs> tendencies? Who, uh, is actually what we need, right? And and, and I think um, many of the surveys that actually show that he's popular, you know, uh, actually might not agree with that particular point, but they like what President Duterte, or at least the kind of projection that President Duterte is actually making. You know, um, and in this case, it's really a question of, well, what exactly is it that he has actually been able to achieve? People see that there are. Achievements that there are that, that that the administration is doing something, right? That that might be debatable, but at least as far as uh, as far as uh, the large majority uh, that the surveys actually show um, uh, of approval for what he is actually uh, doing uh, seems to indicate that uh, that that people seem to actually believe in uh, his le leadership. Um, and I think the problem there, of course, is that 
yeah, we're looking at the short-term consequences, mm-hmm. right? Uh, um, he has done a number of things that we actually that that people actually like, for instance. But the question there, of course, is, well, um, over the long term, if it's no longer a Duterte who's actually sitting as mm-hmm. president, you no, know, what are the consequences then, right? Uh, because that means that we must constantly have somebody with that kind of authoritarian tendency to make things actually work. Mm-hmm. Now, if we're going to ignore the consequences as far as the strengthening of institutions, now that that kind of leadership is actually going to uh, are going to lead to. Mm-hmm. Definitely. No. Because I was thinking as well, no, because the centralization of power, no, the concentration of power on the executive, especially specifically the president, no, it has local ramifications, definitely. No. But what about the in, what about international relations? Because I remember, I think it was under the Duterte term, when we arbitrarily pulled out from the International Criminal Court, no, which is an international agreement, but all of a sudden, no, that since the executive said we do not want this, they were able to pull it out. So the institutions were actually supposed to be in place for that issue. Not it doesn't mean that you no, know, it was a correct or incorrect action, but rather there were institutions that should have at the very least engaged that discussion. No? So given the supermajority, the concentration of power no, on the executive, no, how does that impact foreign relations, especially you know, since there is an issue with China and national sovereignty? Just recently, I think it was June 9, right, when a Filipino fishing vessel was sunk and then abandoned by the... You know, no? What do you think about this notion of concentration of power and then international relations with China? Let's start with you. Well, uh, democratic states, particularly from North, Northern America and Western Europe, they have a problem with Duterte. But... The rest of the world, they don't have any problem, like Russia does not have any problem. China does not have any problem. <laughs> Turkey does not have any problem. The Arab world, they don't have any problem. But what seems to be the common denominator with the, with well, the states? Well, that's, <laughs> the, that's, the, that's the, the common denominator is that Duterte knows that it's dealing with other states with similar characteristics. Mm. That these are strong men, you know, they find democracy too limiting for governance. So, uh, so that's that's why in, in, in the academy now we have now uh, uh, we are now debating on democracy. You know, what from the third wave of democracy after the end of the Cold War? Now we have a uh, regression, you know, democratic regression. So, uh, so that's the kind of context where you can see uh, Duterte's leadership now. So Duterte is very popular in selected countries in Southeast Asia, very popular in Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, uh, even in Singapore, in Malaysia, and even Indonesia, popular. And w- what are these states? You know, you know, uh, and if you will also see, we are so close with North Korea. Mm. We're so close with North Korea. Okay. But at the same time, the Philippines is also very close with Japan. Mm. And we con- the Philippines continues to be an ally of the United States. Mm. We continue to have very good relationship with Australia. Although they have problems on the way Duterte is doing on the area of democracy and human rights, but they still have very good relationship with Duterte. And what Duterte is doing now is, I think it's a clever, a clever diplomacy mm. of, of uh, dealing with the major powers and dealing with the smaller states. Uh, this government knows how to deal with the needs of all these uh, foreign countries. Like, for example, we continue to have very strong relationship with the United States despite mm. our so-called paradigm shift mm. to, to China. In fact, in my conversation with American and Chinese experts, there is now an issue. If you go to China, China is happy about friendly gesture of Duterte, but at the same time, China is questioning the sincerity mm. of Duterte because Duterte is still having this good relationship with, with the United States. But if you talk to the United States uh, experts, they're questioning the loyalty mm. of, of Philippine government to the alliance system. But now, Duterte is so pragmatic to really play the major power game and at the same time, play with the smaller states. Mm. In, in, in ASEAN, uh, uh, he knows how to deal with uh, ASEAN. But what's the outcome of all these things? Mm. What the outcome of all these things? I think uh, we're getting things mm. from US because of that. Mm. We continue to receive foreign military assistance from the United States. This year alone, we're having a lot, like two, more than 200 
different joint military exercises with our American counterparts with the participation of other states like Japan and Australia. Now we are receiving a lot of mm. deals with with China, although big big ticket deals are still not uh, uh, being delivered, but still we're getting. And we're getting a lot more from mm. Japan. In fact, among all the major powers, we're getting concrete things mm. from Japan. So if you will notice now from the recent statements of President Duterte, I think Prime Minister Abe has influenced the, mind, the, 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 thinking, the current thinking mm. now of Duterte when it comes to the issue of the South China Sea mm. and when it comes to our relationship with, with China. I think his visit to Japan really created very big impact on the current thinking now of uh, Duterte. And now we just finished the uh, still ongoing meeting in Honolulu, Hawaii on the Mutual Defense mm. Board. And that is influencing the meeting. And now President Duterte and President Xi Jinping met in uh, Beijing last April mm. during the second uh, BRI uh, forum meeting, the Belt and Road Initiative meeting. So all these things are now making many, many states being puzzled. So what's your end game? What's your bottom line? And I think the bottom line is of the Duterte, I want to get the best of all these worlds. Mm. Okay. And, and I think that's making the Duterte government very, very resilient mm. in the area of foreign policy, in the area of international diplomacy. I would just like to raise this question because you were, uh, Rommel, Rommel was saying, obviously there's an international game no? and Duterte is playing along no? or is playing based on these issues. No? But if there's anything that we can see as well, no, there are trade-offs no, to, to this game, no, to the gains that he gets. No. Specifically, China, because there are now issues of, in return for these investments, it would mean surrendering, or that's the popular impression, no, that sovereignty, national territory, and areas are being surrendered. No. So I'd just like to get your opinion on this. Sermon. And also, this notion no, that when we were talking about foreign policy, if you notice, Roman, no, we were saying this is what Duterte is doing. Duterte is. I think in a democratic society, foreign policy should be decided upon by people through institutions, then represented by the president in this. Uh, no, no, but I think it might be different. No? It's as if you were saying Duterte talks or the, the president talks to these particular heads of state and then he brings back whatever policies he obtains or he negotiates there he brings it back to us and then is implemented no, i think there's i think there's a, uh, is there something problematic or something we're giving away with regards to that dynamic no this one person this very relatively backward flow of diplomatic policy no? well if you look at our constitution the president is also our principal diplomat Right. In other words, uh, that is a constitutional provision, yeah. right? So you can't you can't really you can't really um, uh, understate, so to speak, the responsibility of the uh, of the president as a person, as a personality, uh, as far as foreign policy uh, uh, is actually concerned. Um, I think what is interesting about about the Duterte administration is the extent to which he has personalized. No, especially the relationship with China, right? Um, so he's not just talking about Philippine-China relations, mm. right? He's talking Duterte. about him and uh, in China. I need China, right? He actually mentioned that uh, a few years back. Um, so it's it's in a sense, no, um, uh, 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 it goes beyond the idea of his responsibilities as the chief diplomat of the Philippines. The whole thing is now some uh, uh, about him. You know, uh, as as uh, as the principal initiator of uh, uh, foreign policy for the Philippines, um, but at the same time, you know, and, and I think this is where this is where uh, these are these are some of the things that we might actually miss out when we talk about China, for instance, yeah. right? Um, there's not in really if you look at our relationship with China, uh, the relationship has always been, you know actually good so to speak okay um, and this is something that China finds odd so to speak uh, why is it that Filipinos find China uh, or, or ha has a lot of suspicion with for, for Chinese uh, intentions for instance but if you go back to 
uh, 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 I mean, historically speaking, if you go back to our history with China, no, okay, l- not too far. Let's say uh, at the time when we established, first established uh, uh, diplomatic relations with Communist China, this was during the time of Marcos, mm. right? Mao Zedong actually visited. Yes, exactly, yeah. right? Um, our relationship with China has never been intense, so to speak, but mm. it has never been negative, mm. right? So in, in other words, um, um, in fact, there were, um, you might actually say that that move of Marcos uh, in the first place was, an int- uh, um, was directed at the uh, idea of communist insurgency in the Philippines, the idea of trying to cut off you know, uh, uh, material, uh, material support that, the, that, that um, uh, the People's Republic of China might actually um, uh, provide the New People's Army, for instance. Be that as it may, no, uh, there hasn't really been any uh, major uh, uh, issue as far as our relationship with China is actually concerned. Now, of course, this was before China became a regional hegemon, right? A powerful state, the peaceful rise of China and all of that. And this was before China began to be, uh, began to probe into uh, its ability to actually uh, uh, make its presence felt, mm. no? Uh, in, in, well, beyond the South China Sea, the West Philippine Sea, right? So there are those kinds of things that we actually have to understand, right? Uh, in other words, what I'm actually trying to say is that the relationship with China that we had under the um, uh, uh, Aquino administration is actually a deviation from the normal kind of relationship that we Seems had. to be the, the norm, the new normal. New normal, um, no? You, you could actually make the argument that Duterte is just bringing us back mm. into what was actually the normal relationship mm. that we had with China. Of course, the problem there is that um, this goes against popular uh, perceptions mm. you know, of that relationship that we have with China. Okay? Um, the kinds of, of, of perceptions that were shaped by mm. Chinese activities you know, in the South China Sea and the West Philippine Sea, mm. for instance. Okay? And so when you talk about the idea that we're just trying to bring the relationship back to a normal kind of uh, uh, condition, right? Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, mm. The the language that we we see is, of course, say things like the pivot to China, for mm. instance, right? Um, uh, and, and so, it's 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 not easy to actually make that kind of argument mm. that people will understand that particular uh, 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 administrative um, or uh, this administration's attempts to actually normalize the relationship mm. with China. And what doesn't help is that um, you can juxtapose that you know, with his rhetoric, not mm-hmm. what the government actually does, but his rhetoric Rhetorical. as far as the EU is concerned, mm-hmm. the United States. In other words, as far as our traditional mm-hmm. friends are actually concerned, he's very hostile in, his, in the rhetoric that he actually uses. right? And, and so you get the sense that oh, he's changing mm-hmm. you know, uh, the direction of our foreign policy. Okay? Although, if you look at it objectively, no, to a large extent, uh, we're just going back to what we might say would be a normal relationship with China. Now, of course, the other thing that you have to, to be very careful about is that China is no longer the China that it was before, mm. right? So, if we're talking about normalizing relationships, China right? Versus, China under Mao Zedong, mm. no, um, Hu Jintao later on, no, um, is very different mm. from the kind of China that we're actually facing now under Xi Jinping, mm. right? So in that kind of context, no, um, it's also very difficult to say, oh, we're just normalizing things, mm. right? Precisely because it's a different China that we're actually dealing with mm. now, right? And, and, and dealing with that China might require us to think about, well, okay, uh, can we do, do it on our own, right? Mm. In the way, that, the way that you're actually talking about it earlier on, uh, that Duterte actually is uh, 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 is using this as in, in a strategic gambit, right? Uh, uh, trying to normalize relations with China, but at the same time making sure that even as he says those things about the United States, no, that things are actually normal there. Okay, so I- in other words, if you are actually personalizing the way that we approach this geopolitical situation, this new geopolitical situation right now, the question there is. Um, uh, uh, does it actually mean that we, we, we change the nature 
of our relationship, especially within within the context of the emerging international order that we have right now, right? Uh, so things like multilateral institutions and the way that we tend to ignore that, withdrawing from the ICC, for instance, right? And the way that 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 uh, President Duterte has threatened, for instance, in the past, that may as well withdraw from the UN because it hasn't been able to do anything anyway, right? So. In other words, this is the international system that we've had in the past, you know, post-Cold War situation, right? A system that has uh, seen to the emergence of multilateral institutions, the creation of international norms, you know, and so on. And here is a president in the Philippines actually saying that I'm not too happy about the way those norms are actually uh, 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 operating, so to speak, right? Uh, and, and so when, when you start seeing that, no, and, and the way that we're, we're trying to, um, to reorient, so to speak, no, uh, uh, the kind of foreign policy that we have under the Duterte administration, no, um, then the question that we have is, is there some sort of coherence in the way that this, uh, all of these things are actually being brought about? Thank you. Which, which, then, which then leads me to my next question, Roman, because um, Herman was talking about a gambit. No? You were talking about how Duterte is playing a game or playing an international game of diplomatic <laughs> game Correct. with these heads of state, with these governments. No? But assuming he stays or assuming he just stays for the next three years, no, what would be the, lo what would be the long term impact of this game of the, this highly personalized, this oh, hi, parang Game of Thrones? No? Or it's like Monopoly, right? No? Parang, you're trying to this diplomatic game, no, this diplomatic economic game, no, with these heads of state, with these governments, no. What would happen once the Duterte leaves power and the new head of state would now be faced with the consequences, with the realities created by this highly personalized, highly diplo um, I guess the popular I think it's an extension of what he's doing in the no, no populist relationship with these states. What do you think about that? Well, uh, there are uncertainties after Duterte, but we need to ask whether what, what are the gains of the Duterte administration and what have we exchanged in terms of our foreign policy. So look at China. What have we gained? We gain access to Scarborough Shoal. Okay. Now we can freely move our uh, troops to a resupply and rotation mission in our, in our nine occupied geographic features in the West Philippine Sea. Although Chinese are still around, but we can still do things that we failed to do before. Like for example, now we can now repair the runway of Pagasa Island, and we can now have a port in Pagasa Island. Uh, before China was uh, apprehending our uh, ships carrying construction materials, but in terms of Pagasa Island, China is allowing passage of those. Uh, of uh, ships because of our understanding with China. So that's, the, that's what we are gaining now. But the trade-off is we need to set aside the decision of the International Arbitral uh, Tribunal and at the same time, we need to solve our problems with China bilaterally. Now we have now what we call the Duterte Doctrine now in the South China Sea and that is the bilateral consultative mechanism with China on the South China Sea. And China is offering this kind of model now with Malaysia and offering this model now with Brunei uh, and uh, other claimants like Vietnam. Also Vietnam is not accepting that kind of model. So uh, that's the kind of exchange that we need to do. So just to conclude this session, uh, if there's anything that we can gain uh, from the discussion so far, no, it's that participation is key. No? Um, as discussions on local and international policies are concerned, no? while there is a popular perception on issues, it is imperative that we have a well-nuanced as well as a well-informed um, view and not just um, be driven no, by emotions, by the cliches. No? There might be some validity to these popular perceptions, but it is, it is necessary for us to critically engage them and then later on decide no, whether these perceptions, these issues impact our degree and our nations our, as a community, no, our perspectives on security and quality of life. Once again, thank you very much, Rommel and Herman, for accommodating us for today's session. Thank you for watching and see you in the next session.